clarify, we had nights where we'd watch Disney movies with the sound off and try to do the whole thing from memory. Nice, nice. And it, it turned out quite unique. Each, each one is special in its own way. It's a kind of effect. It's a mix. It, it's karaoke and mystery science theater. All yeah. in one, one happy bundle. I like it. It's pretty uh, good deal. <laughs> now, just a heads up, when I talk, I tend to do this a lot. Just be prepared to slap his head. I guess you like bongos or something else. I breathe in like this. Uh, but once again, ignore, ignore the mic entirely. And I'll pretend it's not there either. And I'll just say, hey, everyone, welcome to Right Night. What's Carol's up? not coming? She's not coming, I know. Oh, why not? Our first time why that not? we don't have Carol. Yeah. But but we, we basically have like almost a whole fresh panel here. Yeah, today. exactly. David, David's like having, having menstrual cramps today. <laughs> uh, I'm I back see. from Montreal. Yeah. No, yeah, no, yeah. Well, you know, your My cycle sink. On, and yeah. <laughs> Good to know. One day we'll get David here, but uh, for now, let's introduce uh, for people new, so everyone knows what's going on. Uh, name, what you do right in the past, what you're writing now, what you'd like to write in the future. Just a little brief something. So myself, Stephen Shanahan, Shaky Shan Online. Uh, past, bunch of web comics. Present, more comics. Uh, future, more, more video stuff uh. and comics. Because I'm kind of on a lot of video stuff. You guys can be more detailed, but I feel like every week I'm going to be saying the same thing, so I'm going to shake it up. Who else is here? <laughs> Uh, I'm Andrew Anthony, uh, an actor writer, and I've written plays in the past as well as web series. Um, and in the future, I hope to write uh, films and graphic novels. Ooh. I'm uh, Chris Cater. I've uh, written for a web comic uh, that isn't running anymore, but uh, <laughs> now I'm working on producing and uh, writing one of the stories for a comic anthology. And uh, in the future, I'd want to write more comic stuff and do some more photography because that's uh, also what I do. Uh, it's Kawhi. Um Yeah, I mostly just write stuff for myself, and uh, future probably write kind of short stories and stuff that I'm trying to focus on. Cool. And uh, I'm Brad, the last of our group. Uh, <laughs> I have a day job in advertising as a content director for an agency, uh, but in the past I've written short films, uh, documentaries, uh, short stories performance poetry uh, oh, wow. really performance have we heard poetry? any of this and, no you, you this, those were my is it us? done with the majesty of song those were my <laughs> those were my high school days and I did some I did some sound poetry which was just phonetics and no real meaning uh, but can you just, pull some of this out right now I, I think I have some recordings I can try and we can maybe can we put those as a, as a link yeah. yeah throw those in I'll send people them out with a little uh, sound yeah, poetry did Why you have a, did you have a name for that like your, your like a poet name yeah a poet name no I just just my own name yeah no. Uh, Pseudonyms are interesting to me, though. The freedom to pick a name to write under. This is true, yeah. But, uh, okay, so that's past and present, I guess. Uh, future is... <laughs> I feel a lacking now. I didn't say new. I recently <laughs> did a... Uh, I finished a short film recently, just a couple months ago, and I'm writing, starting to write a feature. All right. Excellent. Okay, cool. yeah. uh, okay, so tonight's episode... No, not episode, because this is not a podcast, technically. Tonight's group <laughs> You're being session. hosty again. You're, you're very hosty. We're having a right night, guys. How's it going? <laughs> Yeah, woo. Uh, it's a nice topic which I want to talk about. Uh, it's, it's a new topic every week that we do. We jam a bit on for a good hour or so. Uh, it's going to be writing what you know and making up the rest. Or do you? I don't know. That's what we're going to talk about. And as always, I'd like to open up with a bit of a, a bit of a quote from Twitter, source from Twitter. Uh, we got Matt, of course, from London, England, writing in saying, "Learn about it. Write about it. Nice and simple." Uh, like we can get a little more uh, complex because I also did some research beforehand. We got a quote from John Hodgman. Uh, he acted in Bored to Death, The Daily Show. He's the resident yeah. expert as well as I'm a PC in the Mac and PC yeah, commercials. Mm. And he says, it's not enough to write what you know. You have to know interesting things. Do you have, so you have to put yourself in a world where you have experience. You also have to know what you know. Forcing your thoughts and feelings upon the world that does not care, you have to honestly figure about uh, what it is you care about. Figure out what it is you care about. What do you guys know? <laughs> well, can I, can I just comment on the quote for a second? Go for it. Just, I mean, to put yourself in that world, yeah, okay, if you're doing situational comedy, political comedy, fine, you put yourself in that world, but what if you're writing about, you know, axe murderers, drug dealers, like, you know, do you think that the writer of Breaking Bad just goes, okay, I'm going to go do a bunch of math <laughs> yes, totally. because I need to totally. know that world? I mean, yeah, he could talk to recovering addicts or, you know, they talk to a lot of scientists about the makeup of it, but, I, like, there's only so far you can go, you know? Like, if, you, if you're writing about someone who shoots somebody, are you going to go kill someone to test it out? Like, uh, I think that uh, that sentiment is in league with um, method acting, 
Uh, that's uh, why I knew you were going to be here tonight. Yeah. So I'm like, we have an actor with us. We can use this. Uh, I figured he was going to say and, and I think, I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you do have to draw a line. I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of method acting. It's no. actually, if you do your research, it's actually a diluted perversion of the Stanislavski system, which was, was about the magic if. It was about putting yourself in that situation. And what if I were in that situation? How would I feel? What would I think? Um, so I think uh, an, a better articulated statement, rather than write what you know, uh, might be... Be confident with your idea. People have a lot of brilliant ideas, and it's informed from everything that we've read and watched, and playing with our toys, even stories and relationships. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. uh, so it, if you just had an idea for something that's really interesting, uh, I think that writing with confidence is the key. Um, for instance, I, I, the project I'm just coming off of right now, I, I finished a, a play I'm writing, um, and there is a lot of evidence in there of uh, of me, and that was pointed out by my favorite person to have read my stuff, my best friend. And then there's a lot of stuff that I invented, like new science that takes place in the future. And uh, I'll, I'll end my little bit off with uh, <laughs> something that I heard when I, when I was in England, a uh, writer for the BBC. Uh, she said, uh, take your audiences anywhere, just, just bring them back. <laughs> That's, that, and if you do that, if you bring them back, you've, you've locked them in and, and they have a, a good chance of at least uh, um, auditing what you're handing them. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't just take them somewhere and leave, leave them, them there, there stranded. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's my thought on that. Isn't that kind of like having the hero of your story is always the one who's asking all the questions in a way? So like, there you can have your wacky, strange world, but there's at least one person to bring oh, it the, back the, all the, the time anchor. in a way. They're like the one who brings the audience into yeah. that world. Because they're, they're the Luke Skywalker who's always yeah. like, "There's aliens at a bar. What's going on?" <laughs> it's not like you've been living here, Luke. <laughs> yeah, you, <know>? yeah, sure. <laughs> you got the farm at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> But nope. is, is, that, the is that your kind of suggestion of, is, or is it more at the very end you pull them back like we're in Narnia and now we're back in London um, do you that. know what I, some of the best ideas I've ever heard are ones that I'm still trying to wrap my head around uh, <laughs> I, I think that that, I, that sentiment changes for me sometimes it is about literally bringing somebody back yeah. uh, <laughs> Peter um, Pan, but, back. but in other instances I think bring it back in, in the way that I've most recently related to it is, 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 is that very thing let, let the audience member relate to it and I feel like they become mm-hmm. the anchor Right. Rather than a character being cynical and outside of the box going like, what is all this, eh? <laughs> I'm on the audience's side because we don't understand these new ideas. Yeah. Let, let everyone be immersed in it and let the audience be the anchor. Let them think they're smart when they catch on the subtext <laughs> and they go, oh, that, that's practically kitchen sink, even though it's space. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's kind of the root of like British farce, right? Like every farce is the audience has the wide view they can see the people coming in and out of the doors and just missing each other and (laughs) you know people swinging and spinning around at the wrong moment they see the wider picture and that's why it's funny where they're watching everyone else bumble around on stage and not seeing what's actually happening you know I I think that's and TV shows do that a lot like procedural cop shows there's like Criminal Minds is a great one where every episode of Criminal Minds we know who the killer is two minutes into the show and then we watch the show going, well, I'm smarter than all these behavioral <laughs> yeah. analysts. I figured it out already. Yeah. They're like, Dramatic they're like maybe yeah. it's a woman. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I know it's a woman. I saw that. It was in the first 30 seconds. <laughs> it sounds like raising a it's child. Like, it's like, you looks know, like the it's over here. Dude just looked like a lady. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that well, that's there's something to that, like letting the audience sort of see the bigger picture and then watching the characters get there. We, we have a, an invested interest in it. We want to see them figure it out. <laughs> or in the case of like Columbo, we know who did it and we know he knows they did it. <laughs> We're trying to see how he gets <laughs> them yeah, to p- give it explain away. Explain it you know? to me like I'm a child. <laughs> that was more Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Javar, I just don't understand. <laughs> 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 um, let me think. Yeah, I, was, I was just wondering if you, if you guys had thought on that too, because you know you were well, going to say something we interrupted. Like um, uh, for for writing stuff, um, I often like pull from my own personal life and things like that, and I get ideas here and there, and I may not use actual events or anything, but I might write along the same themes. So you know, when I'm trying to think of a situation where two people have a cross, like a crossing, or just like something they have to deal with, I try and find similar things that I've gone through. Mm-hmm. to give myself a better perspective on how they may be emotionally and things like that. So you find uh, not, not necessarily the same external situation, but something that would have affected you emotionally the same way as your character exactly. would. Exactly. Yeah. And it, I, I've noticed even recently now, I've been reading a lot of my old stuff that I, that I wrote, that I could actually start spotting and putting parallels to what I wrote 
important to the certain mm. events because a lot life, of the time I'm not see necessarily where you're drawing from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I may not yeah. be thinking about it at the time that I'm writing. I'm just kind of like going with the flow when you're in that. Yeah. In the in the zone writing, and uh, then later I go back and I'm like, oh man, psychoanalyzing myself. <laughs> 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 and that can be really eye opening, you know, with bigger artists when you look at their like body of work, like. You know, a director like Wes Anderson, you look at all his films and you go like, well, what, what does he have with dads? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> that may not be something he's aware of, but then looking back in retrospect, you might go, well, you know, obviously there's something personal that he's relating to when he produces his works. Well, that's always been the case, like, uh, when people analyze writers for, like, their courses, and it's like, oh, this was an allegory for this and this was that, and whether they really it was or not, yeah. if they were alive at that time of, like, wars and things. World War II. Like, the book wasn't about World War II at all, but being in that world influenced everything. It had to did. have an effect living in wartime, yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeah. the smartest ideas that anyone could analyze um, uh, just kind of creep up on me as a writer, where it just isn't intentional. <laughs> like, you've written something and then you look back on it and go, uh, because we've all had to read things analytically, yeah. uh, you look at it and go, oh man, oh, that, this is something someone might say about this someday. Like, <laughs> it was like, oh, that's oh, so we, clever here. <laughs> yeah, and then I went true to it. Like, for instance, uh, it, in the the script I'm writing, it takes place in the future, uh, I, I noticed there was an absence of religion in it. No one talked about Bibles or any kind of organized religion. No one even said God. So when I did another read of it, I saw there was one slip where someone said God, and I made the choice to take it yeah. out. But I didn't make the choice for there to be no presence of God in the, in, in the production of it. Right, so, right. so it was kind of me responding to what it became. Uh, so, so oftentimes it's, you have a lot of discovery in the writing process. A lot of times the mentality seems like it's, I, I've created something, and I'm putting it on paper, and now it's done. Yeah. It's it's actually a, a back and forth kind of thing. Um, the projects we work on kind of kind of put something into us too. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I mean, it's like writing is 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 rewriting. You know, like when you wrote that out unconsciously, just kind of your mind just went there and informed the work that way. But if you hadn't gone back and gone through it again and made that realization, you know, you wouldn't have been able to add that extra layer. Mm -hmm. it's interesting. How do you guys struggle with uh, being able to reapproach your work? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I take a break. Yeah, I, take I, have, break. I have to take a break. I'll take like a couple of months and then just go back at it with fresh eyes because it's impossible to be objective. My, my day gig working at an agency, I'm editing, mm -hmm. and they'll always go, well, how do you think the edit's working? And I just go, I've seen it about 50 million times. <laughs> yeah. I've heard this song 50 million times, and I really... I want it to go away more than anything. <laughs> I can't. I can't tell you whether it's good or bad. If, if changing this or changing that really fixes it, because it's you just kind of go based on what you tend to know is good. Is that one of the things that give you the need to wanna to wanna write and create? Is this we want to satiate something because we're just so bored with the same stuff we're seeing? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, kind of novelty yeah. create. Like, a lot of stuff's a lot of cookie cutter. Yeah. Uh, stuff that we're fed and. So a lot of time you're like, oh well, I'm kind of tired of this, and your imagination's still going, and you, you create what you want, what you create don't see. something, yeah, that yeah. you want instead of, yeah. I, I've always had trouble with trying to create something new for the sake of it being fresh for me, and just going polar opposite for the sake of breaking the, the right. cookie cutter, <laughs> and then and that's very empty, and that's something that I find I struggle with. Uh, and uh, on the topic of putting some of ourselves into things, that's me putting some bullshit into yeah. things. <laughs> I find uh, sometimes for me it's more like you'll, you'll see something play out e either in life or in a movie or a TV show and you think, it would have been funnier if he did this. Yes. 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 But that never happened. That's yeah. where the best ideas yeah. come from. I am, I am petty <laughs> and I'm competitive and I admit that. There's so many times when I've seen a movie and I've gone, I could have done such a better job. Really? I could have done so much better than these people. And that actually inspires me to go and write something because I'm just like, if this if this yeah. guy got his got movie his job, made, yeah. <laughs> then there's no reason I can't. But often for me, it's like it'll be like a serious drama or a musical. I'm like, you know, it'd be completely inappropriate for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> right back back. So like, this would never happen. Yeah. Now the children are in the <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that kind of, it's that kind of inspiration. Um, there, there's a thought with the. Uh, you know, uh, write what you know, and some people think their lives aren't terribly interesting. They're just kind of like in their house all the time and not living it. it. Do you force yourself in, like, not method acting in that way, but do you put yourself in bizarre situations so you can experience, like, not being in control of your environment at all? I mean, I think it's definitely useful to have novel experiences. Like, if, you, if you, all you know is, like, one room, there's only a certain amount of things you can write, mm -hmm. truthfully, or, like, that will have a sense of authenticity, which is not the greatest word. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I think to the quote that uh, John Hodgman was saying, it's just like, you need to experience more things to be able to write more things. So it's just yeah. like, I, it's not, I guess when he says write what you know, it's just try to 
find like try to experience more you know sure but i think it's important yeah. to be careful because i mean i i think we both know uh, a writer i won't say his name but he actively he wants to write from what Bukowski called where it's at. I'm so glad you mentioned Bukowski. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like this Bukowski writes about like the you know, he writes about the lowest of life, the blue collar, the guy also the most simple shit, like a dream about a cat. Yeah. Or like, you know, the guys getting wasted in bars and sleeping yeah. with hookers and he writes these stories and, and uh, you know, Bukowski then wrote this this poem called The Secret of My Success which is basically uh, saying, you know, people write me these letters and say, I know where it's at, and I write from where it's at. Little do they know that their letters arrive at my two-garage, white picket fence, <laughs> beautiful house in suburbia. You know, I mean, he's, he's making fun, and he's exaggerating. Um, but I think that, you know, you can't also... It feels forced if you go and you say, like, well, I want to write about the blue-collar life, and then you go and, like, go to the dingiest part of town and go to the crappiest bar, and you try to hang out with those people to try and, I don't know create some real experience it's forced it's not going to be real you can't relate with them on a real level because you don't come from the same place so I think it's it's more like what if from your own experience can you you know if you're writing about hardship write from hardship as much as you've experienced but don't like force hardship upon yourself don't like yeah don't go like you know if you're writing about a hunger strike or don't go and starve yourself you know you can relate to a time when you were wanting when you didn't have everything you needed Mm -hmm. I mean, to a certain, okay. certain extent, like, some of that is just research. I'm not saying go fake your way into someone's life or anything, <laughs> but, like, sometimes it, it's definitely useful. If you're going to talk about a specific situation that ex- actually exists, you kind of know, like, exactly the de- – not the details, but exactly, like, kind of what's happening in it, right? Mm-hmm. If you're going to try to write a real situation, you shouldn't make up shit if you know nothing about it. No, I mean, I mean, well, not the yeah. external details. I guess more like I meant the sort of the emotional core of it. Like, you know, we all have – Emotions and they're all based on a certain range of experiences that we've had. But I, I think we don't need to go and live those lives to be relatable. No, yeah, but you still need to know yeah, what's <laughs> happening. Like, if, like if you're going to write like about the, someone shooting a gun, you need to know how a yeah, gun works. Yes. Exactly. But like that's that's kind of to be honest, one of the beauties of the internet now is you can you find shit up. <laughs> more and more information on things. Like I was writing a story once uh, that was sci-fi and it had um, some black hole stuff in it. And so I spent, just because I love freedom, space, and astronomy and everything, I just started studying for, like, weeks. <laughs> just reading a whole bunch of string theory and, like, parts uh, and, like, the different uh, parts of the black hole and the different areas and, like, how it all worked. And then later on, I didn't even put half of that in, but I could write confidently about the situation a little bit better. I <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I, I, I recently... Um, like I said, there's there's a bit of myself, and then there's new science to create. Yeah. Like in the project, um, I sent a draft to my best friend. I said, "Listen, I don't feel like I can get any further unless you help me with these questions." I gave him like three kind of uh, mind munches I was working on, and he said to me uh, it, that I was getting bent up on the science of it all, and I wasn't making any decisions. Right. Right. Like, what kind of story are you telling? Like, because I threw a lot of balls in the air and I wasn't catching them again, and I find that doing research in general can sometimes uh, be a bit of a rabbit hole and, yeah, and, and make me down. like lose sight of what I was writing initially yeah it got to the point where you just wanted to like make sure everyone heard the same facts oh, and you I was, heard. Like, yeah, I heard yeah. so many. Look how much it's research like, I did. You're, you're, not, you're yeah. not making a technical manual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, when you, that's uh, almost what I ended up doing. Because and I was and I realized I wasn't works. writing for this, the characters or the story that was trying to be told. I was writing for all my friends and assholes who I know who would, be the, who would be in the audience going, no, how do you do that? That doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, oh yeah, motherfucker? Well, this character's gonna say this. Yeah. I definitely had first drafts of scripts where there was always the scene with the doctor or the scientist or like the educated Ex- friend. Doctor exposition. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> There's always that moment where it's like, what do you mean I'm sick? Well, you've got this really rare illness that only 50% of da, da, da. And like, they just go off on this, and I was like, wait a minute, no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even have to say what it is. Like, they can just, they're sick, you don't know, it doesn't matter. Like, just yeah, always end it with, story? like, it's science. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you see that, a wizard did. Like, and really good line was in, in Looper when uh, Levitt and Willis are oh, in yeah, the he's diner. He's like, talk. man, we're going to be laying straws on the table all day if we try to have that conversation. I'm like, oh, that's a great aversion. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the way. <laughs> Let's put that 
question to bed. I guess sometimes we could just ask the audience to shut off their minds for a second. It's like, you don't need an answer for why it works. Just yeah. accept that it works. I had sure, a, well, that was my problem with Primer, if you ever saw that movie. Yes, Shane I, I agree. Yeah. Like, after the movie, I, that's the only movie I've ever seen where me and the people watching it got out pieces of paper and started scribbling charts. <laughs> yeah. well, they're like, well, no, but then he's on this timeline. Then he loops back around. And, and then the, the writer said so. He said that if anyone watched that movie and said they knew what it was all about at the end of it. They were either a liar or a savant. And, yeah. and that people would have to do that. Yeah, no, and, but ultimately, I think it kind of detracted from enjoying it, you know? Like, really? Okay, yeah. Taking it wasn't that part of the experience, though. I, I suppose, I mean, I guess that's what he was going for, yeah. but, like, I would almost, I enjoyed Looper just as much, where you just go, okay, it doesn't matter how it happens, it just does, or, or Back to the Future, where it's like, don't, don't worry about it, yeah. just enjoy. Why is it 88.8? It's, it's point eight, is Star Trek, man. You just sit back and enjoy. Sometimes stuff works some ways, and then later on it doesn't work that way anymore. Sure. And you just have to just go, whatever, it just but, doesn't work in this situation because oh, uh, of space. Thank you for smoking. <laughs> uh, the guy who plays Jameson in Spider-Man was in that movie, and uh, he had uh, he had a script on his desk, and, and they were talking about the laws about having characters like smoke in the movie. And he's like, uh, I know it's like a space romance action, but we need him smoking on that ship. Uh, wait a minute, but it's space. You can't really light up in there. Uh, no, just... Write in a piece of dialogue. Thank God for the thingamajig. <laughs> and they go, oh, good. And they, like he just ate it like, go get me a coffee. It was just so normal to him. He's yeah. like, yeah, totally. That, that's what we'll do. <laughs> thank, thank God they invented the points of the machine. It looks like a motor on a wall. Thank God that's there. Thank God that's there. Because, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, otherwise you do get a very kind of tech manual experience. And I, I thought like some, some Star Trek does lead to that because they want to give you more science well, yeah, there's fiction a lot of versus battle, fantasy. Right? They're, They're like, just, this yeah. does this and that. It's mostly propulsion. made up tech about like, like, if someone's telling you about their spectral drive, you're like, so does it work on rainbows? Like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, you can, go, you can go too far. Like, CSI is the ultimate example of that. Yeah. If you watch that show, it's literally always just like, they go to the scene, they play some music, and there's a montage with flashes of light, and then they're back in the lab, and there's more flashes of light and music, <laughs> and then they go, we found this science dealie that solves the crime. Well, how's come off flying glasses? And identifies, <laughs> this blood slot identifies that it was him. There's no writing to the story. They literally just have a science montage, and then it's done. On Dr. House MD, I just kind of stopped listening to the ramblings, and all I heard was, ah, rah, 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 not lupus. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that whatever he was saying was <clears throat> fucking smart. <laughs> well, it's funny, actually. I have a, a cousin who was a technical advisor on the show Numbers. He's a mathematician in oh. California, Pasadena, uh, university professor, and basically... His job is to come up with math mumbo jumbo for wow. them to say. It's like, uh, it's uh, Fibonacci. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, it was so difficult for the actors mm-hmm. in the first mm-hmm. season that every time they showed a close up of a hand writing numbers on the chalkboard, it was his hand. It was his hand yeah. because yeah. they couldn't use, like, the actors couldn't write it as quickly and as that he, that they needed to, scribbly yeah. as a real mathematician. So every so often, he had to shave his hands <laughs> and the women. Paint the nails. We the need nails. you to make your hand look <laughs> like David <laughs> Crumbles. <laughs> Why are you making me do this? We love Monty Python. This is just for us. <laughs> I'm wondering if, um, for yourselves, have you written a project or a script before that you just hadn't touched for years and you come back and realize, like, everything you know is different now? Like, like in, back in, like, do high you, school. Like, what were we thinking? Well, like, back in high school, I'd write things like, oh, this is what college is going to be like and what living in a, you know, a apartment with roommates is going to be like. When I finally got there, it's like, Everything Thanks. was wrong. It was all based on what I knew at the time, and ah, have you ever like ran into that, like revisiting yes. some works? Um, Absolutely. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> yeah. I would have to say yeah. Yeah. Especially I, about relationships. In high school, yeah. I wrote stuff about, like, I guess, you know, high school's dramatic. Relationships are dramatic. Yeah. I wrote stuff that was so fatalist and extreme about relationships. <laughs> and I come back and I'm like, whoa, man, I needed to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> but my final, Nothing is ever that serious. But almost in a way, would that not make it more true to writing that story again? Like, if you were to write a high school, like, uh, all of us writing, like, a high school script would be like, oh, stupid. Romance See, that's an interesting blah, idea. Yeah. But the yeah. only information you might, might have had at that time was probably Romeo and Juliet and whatever you saw on television. Yeah, it was like, you know, <laughs> so it's episodes of Charmed and Buffy. Oh like, that's yeah. what was, you That's know. life and death. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I almost wonder now, because uh, some of the scripts I write for comics tends to be, like, more uh, youth-catered. But I'm, like, sitting here being like, I haven't been in grade school in how long? I don't know how much it's changed. Like, I don't even know if I could, like, does grade school well, ever change? Well, that's it, too. The grade could school experience isn't, isn't the same as the one yeah. that we had. I mean, my, my uh, fiancé is a teacher, grade 7 and 8. And she says to me, like, oh, we had a problem first week of school. I'm like, what happened? She goes, oh, well, the kids were sexting each other. Really? Sexy, that never came up? Sexy text Luba. messages. And I'm like, what? 
I remember getting all worked up when I found out there were kids smoking in the back. Like, what? Things are just... I mean, it's always going to be that way. Like, you know, every generation you're going to go, well, the kids today, man, they're just... Way yeah. beyond what we ever did. No, the forest is just changing. I mean, yeah. if you look, look at the crucible, uh, uh, how, uh, sorry, how people they didn't how, have sex. No, no, but back in like back in back in like pastoral times, like and people would like hide in the forest to get away with shit. Like it's where you hit all the taboo and the sex yeah, and all that jazz. Them, yeah, it's just the forest is taking different shapes, and now it's like okay. you know in your pocket. It's a cell I mean, phone. What that's I, what these kids are doing. When I was in grade school, like we started learning about sex and stuff like that in like grade five. Yeah. And like to, to people that I know who are older than me, they're like, What? They did that in school at that young? It's like, yeah, like they just tried to give us as much information as often as possible so that we were now, more prepared. You know, all the kids are going to see Twilight when they're in oh you know, whatever yeah. super well, young. There's, there's not that much sex in the Twilight. But it's between the that and the Jonas Brothers, no, I think South Park is right. It's, <laughs> it's it's Disney and like the man trying to sell sex to young yes. However, Sure, well hell, have I, you seen the trailer for Spring Breakers? Oh no. Not a Disney God. movie, but it's all Disney yeah. girls. It's all Disney stars. <laughs> Harmony Corinne takes on Disney starlets all in bikinis the entire movie. Yeah. Wow. Robbie Banks or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh. It's Harmony Corinne. It's from the man who brought you Trash Humpers. See, I mean, I mean what? <laughs> It's real. Look it up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Keep that in mind. But yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, like it also depends like what do you want to convey to that younger generation? Do you want to get something that's more true to them or do you want to pass on knowledge that you experienced to try and bring them closer to what reality is. Mm-hmm. I don't have a whole lot of knowledge that I can say <laughs> and that was genuinely passed on to me. I think that's what I've been learning whenever I think about when I'm going to be a parent someday. Uh, I, uh, I just today I was brushing off the um, uh, snow from my car and like you know my stepdad's there. We just waved to each other. I'm like, yeah, we're a couple of men, and he asked me to do this. I shoveled the drive for him. My kid will do that for me. We'll be friends. <laughs> and, I thought, and, I, and I thought to myself, you know what? I can I can totally account for myself. It, maybe. But I can't account for like for him slash me like when it comes and etc. I can't guess what's gonna happen. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't think a whole lot of things were taught to me. You kind of have to touch the hot plate. Yeah. I don't know. Like from <laughs> the stuff I read growing up, I learned that with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I got like, drilled into my head pretty quick. So <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of wish we had sort of. Uh, not to say this is a gender thing, but the thing about the dad and son, I mean, a lot of stuff is unspoken in the male world, you yeah, know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't sit down and have the big talks. You just kind of, you're sitting next to him and you kind of nod and there's this understanding, Gruff, you know? <laughs> like, you know, I, I I don't know, maybe in the female pers- side of things, it's a, di- it's a different story. There could be a lot more talks. Like, me and my father did have a fair amount, but, I mean, it's all situational. Like, you know, sure. me and my father were separated a young a young age, so we ended up talking a lot more because we never saw each other. So, right. So it's really different from different perspectives. That's true. So on that side, if if you wanted the female perspective, I guess, would you then have to like interview people, being like, how how do you talk to your? You're mother? saying if you were to write like a female character, if, if you want that character as your lead or just in your story. I, I my favorite characters read are often female. I think it's but that it's, I grew up with women like I grew up around five women uh, and very like little male attention uh, but I don't feel like that informed me necessarily <laughs> <laughs> now this is this is interesting to me because I mean one of the things that you're seeing more and more now is like oh well this is the kind of story that only could have been told by a woman you know only a woman director could have brought this to light only uh, a female writer or you know conversely to take it away from gender uh, there was a movie 50 50 yeah uh, which was about a a guy who was dealing with a cancer diagnosis and trying to get through that and the writer of that movie it was his experience of having gone through cancer and it's like well is his experience going to be truer than you know somebody who would never had cancer never experienced that who just done research spent time with survivors and then written a movie like that you know like why are we I mean they market it that way why is there are we drawn to stories where we think well they've got the real scoop because they (laughs) experienced it there's a in Canadian theater history I learned about one of the early kind of Native American plays that were really important to the culture and and, uh, I'm ashamed that I can't remember right rightly the title but I do know that it, it wasn't written by an American uh, and and that was that was this very topic was the thing that kind of came up in class. It's like appropriation whether, kind of thing, right? Yeah, exactly. And no matter how true or it hits home, does is the message ever tainted based on the source? Mm-hmm. And and that stays true with the. Um, sometimes when we are putting ourselves in our scripts, sometimes I shy away from putting things in there because I know close people to me are going to read it, and I'm going to think, ah, oh, man, they're going to think I'm using this as a vessel to unload. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm like. 
but but I'm torn because my character wants to, the, the character in the story wants to say it in yeah. that moment. I, I think you should be true to your character. Exactly. Right? I've certainly got those stories that it's like, man, I would totally take this out of my parents' life and put that in a script, but I probably can't do it until they're dead <laughs> <laughs> because they would just not be happy at all. Uh-huh. So like, like you can't those, come see my movie premiere. They're locked in the vault for maybe one right. day to tell. I like that you say locked in the vault, given that sense of the, the perpetual back burner we all have, yeah. because that means that we're not saying no to anything and we don't necessarily have a sacred cow. We just know there's a thing of timing. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's the same thing like Django Unchained. Uh, there was a big thing about that where Spike Lee came out and he said, Quentin Tarantino can't tell a story about slavery. He can't make that movie because he doesn't have in his bones, in his heart, that, that you know, growing up with that knowledge and that history and that experience. Yeah, he tweeted uh, that uh, my ancestors were not in uh, Sergio Leone's Spaghetti Western. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's tweeting all this bullshit and he didn't, he didn't watch the movie. And I mm-hmm. thought, ah, that's ignorant because you got Spike Lee who calls his movie Sp- Spike Lee Joint. Yeah. What kind of imagery is that supposed to give to the filmmaker with all the values he holds when he makes his stuff and his ideals and the audiences he's hoping to reach? You're calling your thing a joint. Are you saying that they're mm-hmm. going to respond to drug culture more? Like you could challenge him to, as a hypocrite. But this, I don't know. I got really uppity when I heard about all that. <laughs> yeah. I got to, damn, dial it back. <laughs> how, how is what Tarantino's doing any different from, you know, black exploitation? He said in his interviews, like, I'm trying to create an action hero for the African American community that doesn't really have one right now. Like, you know, there isn't really a an African American, I mean, maybe Blade. Uh, you know, the bring back. Cowboy yeah, running around shooting, getting getting all the women. Like you know, Tarantino, he makes stuff that veers into art house highbrow territory, but mostly he's making like popcorn enjoyable movies, you yeah, know? Just he never pretends to do anything else. Mature. Django was a badass. I really enjoyed that movie. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, at the point when the horse starts dancing, you know it's not supposed to be serious. <laughs> well, <laughs> the horse my, dance? What? Oh, my you need to see it. <laughs> my only complaint about that movie was the skull speech. And yeah. that was where, on the topic of putting yourself in your scripts, I... Um, you're all familiar with you've seen the movie you know you understand DiCaprio's character yeah okay so they made it really clear no. don't speak other than, uh, no. <laughs> based no. on the character he's yeah. the type of person where you, he's, he's dangerous and powerful but you don't want to insult his intelligence because he has delusions of grandeur right, right. don't so speak other a, languages in front of yeah. him don't be you know too right. literate um, so he comes out and he gives this classic Tarantino speech that you know the kind of stuff from the early 90s like his grittiest shit that you know uh, uh, that everyone emulated in the 90s where someone has a really clever speech right. and now I'm going to bring it back to the subject matter and wink back at that speech and then it's, it's that, that formation I feel like he's evolved and grown as a, as a writer and that one speech was this little fragment of himself that he put in he there he couldn't resist and exactly yeah, yeah. and I don't know if he's it's almost uh, this is for a very dirty way to say it, but a parody of himself. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Did, a little bit, yeah. did you like, see Death I, Proof? That whole movie was a parody of himself. <laughs> He's actually <laughs> disowned that movie. Himself. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I understand, understand that. that. Wow. When you've got a, when you've got you know a bunch, it starts with a bunch of girls in a diner, and the camera's panning around them, just like Reservoir Dogs. You know, yeah. it's just like. He's, he's, he likes to make pop culture references, but now he's pop culture. He's, he's become himself. it. Exactly. He's got to go back in on it. Yeah. Really he's agree. incepted that like himself. The one <laughs> spot of the movie that Dude, I'm like, like just that take char- that out. That character's not that smart. He's not that sentimental. If anything, he would have come in that room. Just, I would have was... been more terrified if he said nothing. Yeah. It's like, what is this child going to do? Yeah. <laughs> But no, it's just, that was the one piece of Tarantino he was refusing to let go, and you're just like, oh, that is so Tarantino with his head up his ass a little bit, and just putting it in there <laughs> but again. Here's, now, that's a larger scale of the small thing that I was saying. Yeah. You are a writer, and you, you know that your audience is familiar with you. In yeah. my small case, it was I know that the core group of people I'm giving the script to are familiar with me. <laughs> so now you are cognizant of what you're putting into the script of yourself, and you now have to make decisions of what to hold and put back because it's, it's going to hurt the story. Yeah, but in this case it's going back to being true to the character. That wasn't being true to the character. Being true to exactly. himself in a way. So, so, sometimes, true so what I mean to say is when you are when someone recognizes your writing and, and they know you as a writer now and maybe they've seen a lot of your work now they're going to kind of they hold it in that context. It's very unforgiving. It's very unforgiving. I, I knew there was an actress who was uh, raving about um some amazing physical uh, activities that she was going through, different classes to learn how to really access all of her body when she's right. doing a character. Because after 15 years of, of, of really steady stage performing, uh, someone came up to her, uh, a close family friend, and said, oh, I just loved you tonight. And at first I had no idea you were that other character in Act 2 until you put your hand on your hip. Because I said, <laughs> that's my Maggie. And uh, she hated that. 
Oh, she realized, yeah, yeah. shit, that's my Maggie. They saw Maggie up there because she had her own isms. Right, right. So it's, it's, it's funny that we, have, we kind of have to be co- have a, I don't want to say a leash, that's too negative, but we need to be cognizant of what we're putting of ourselves into our work uh, to the point where it's, on, uh, it's putting a weight on the character rather than helping them. Is it, is it like you trying to find your own... Because people are gravitate to your work because you stand out for a certain reason. Like, you write a certain style that they enjoy. Let, let's say we, if we enjoy Kevin Smith, it's because he has these long rants with, like, cuss words once in a while, and that's the uh-huh. style. If he all of a sudden stops doing that, are we just like, oh, you're not the, the writer you once were. You're different now, and I'm not, I don't I, like this as much. Well, like, but, but what do you owe to your audience? Uh, you know, I mean, like, like, I think there's, there's, there's two different topics there. There's, like, whether or, uh, yeah, whether or not you can grow as, a, uh, uh, as an artist, and, like, do you, yeah, like, do you owe something to your uh, audience like can you change and like oh betray who you were and the second thing is like whether or not you're writing true to those characters you, you can have a specific style but if you make your characters unreal to a certain extent like like just uh, Kevin Smith's voice yeah, in the character then yeah. it kind of spoils the story I mean you can keep your style while being true to a character and you know that speaks to Kevin Smith that he's not really known for creating really complicated characters this is kind of like <laughs> He, he, had a, he had a noble effort with his Daredevil series, uh, if, if, if you had a chance to read that. Anyway. And I, I, I'd have to say it was some of it, it's his most like mature writing, and I only got it through osmosis from what I read, like that Jake pawned off to me. But yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, I, it, it did make me think that whether you're going to dial it back or not, um, offer something new maybe. That way people don't go, oh, it's not the same writer I always loved. Give yeah. them something else to like. And then it's, and it's still very right. Maybe they like, maybe your thing isn't your rants. Maybe your thing is just telling a damn good story uh, and having it unfold really well. And you know, your thing can even be being changeable, being variable. Look at Steven Soderbergh. You know, you've got a guy who directs <laughs> Ocean's Eleven on one hand, and then he goes and does Solaris. You know, they couldn't be more different from each other. Mm-hmm. And then he goes and does a movie, you know, completely on digital video and <laughs> super indie. You know, like he, he can go back and forth, and now he's got a reputation. His thing is doing different things. You know? I don't think you should ever, like, if you want to do something, I think you should do it. If you suddenly are like, well, I've made all these comedies, I want to make a serious, serious film, I think, I don't think you should hold yourself back from it, because that's your natural development. It's like, then you're being typecast by yourself. <laughs> yes, that's, that's exactly <laughs> You know, I mean, in the internet world, you can all look at, like, someone like Freddie Wong, YouTube celebrity who does video game parodies all the time, and now it's like, he couldn't do something that wasn't a video game tied to video game parody now. If you did it, people would be like, that wasn't Call People would be TV. like, well, this isn't what I came here for. But, you know, uh, he'd maybe find a whole new audience of people. Well, I mean, like, almost, like, with that guy, maybe he should, you know, take a pseudonym, start a different channel, and try something <laughs> else. Channel sure. B. I mean, like, then you're, like, saying to these audience, this is not what you're gonna, it's not what I've done before. It's just... I think sometimes, you know, if you want to try something different, maybe you just have to be straight up with your audience. It's like, yeah, I'm trying something different. This isn't what you're going to come here for before, yeah. you know? Maybe the audience just should always be a variable in our minds. Maybe we should never think that we're writing to the same audience as last time. Mm-hmm. It's like this project's going to have its own audience. And well, why would they like that? You really aren't, depending on what you're doing. I mean, if, yeah. if you normally write fantasy and then all of a sudden you're writing, you know, something more uh, fi- uh, non- or f- nonfiction-based, then you're kind of like, well, do the people that love your fantasy work are they going to love your nonfiction as well? Or are you now writing to a nonfiction crowd? Yeah, you, you, you do have to sort of, you have to kind of ignore some of the external voices in the situations like that. Like I know um, J.K. Rowling, when she released yeah. her first, <laughs> non- <laughs> first yeah. non Harry Potter book, I, like, literally, I, I literally read an article. We were coming up to it, it was inevitable. Yeah. <laughs> there was an article that like literally was like on page 157, they say blowjob. <laughs> on page 232, they say. Felicio. Like, like it just broke down, like, page by page, what the sex was in the book and how it was so different from Harry Potter. And it's like, and so what? Well, yeah, the you sex in Harry Potter point. was very different, I guess. I, I guess. <laughs> it was called Snoggy, okay? It was... There was more British slang in that one. <laughs> well, I, on, on the topic of JK, I was, I was going to say that... Um, uh, I, I, I read the, the shite out of the Harry Potter series. I grew up with it. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, ask me what her new book's about. I don't what, know. what is it about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I'm and sure there's lots of people who do. And lots of people who do, and, and you know, and I kept, I, I'm perpet- I have no reason to not want to read it, and yeah. I keep telling myself, oh, I gotta buy that book. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I do want to, and I think it'll be great. But I, it, I have to say it because yeah. we're on the topic of <laughs> audiences well, the, keeping. Well, the thing is, it's not Harry Potter, right? So you, you don't really know what you're gonna get. I mean, you read Harry Potter one, and then you see there's like you know another six, mm-hmm. and you're kind of like, well. 
I know what I'm going to get from now on is more of this. I'm going to keep reading. You sure. know? But now you're got getting a different book, and it's not Harry Potter, and you're kind of like, oh. And you can get tired the other way, too. Like, when you stay, stay too, like, unchangeable. Like, I grew up with the Scholastic Book Orders. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I read I probably that. about 100 Goosebumps books. Yes. Yeah. yes. And every single one was pretty much the exact same story. But, like, you know, this time there's a mask that will come off. And this time the house is haunted. So and you, you guess what you place. just ate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah. then you grow out of it. And that, you know, people grow out of directors. People grow out of films. Films that they once loved. Books that they once loved. Suddenly they just, ah, it's not for me anymore. It doesn't speak to me anymore. Yeah. It's a different type. You read it nostalgically, maybe, but it doesn't really apply to anything you do now. Yeah. I actually get kind of nervous when I try to revisit things. Because uh, you don't want to spoil. Oh, you don't want the, yeah. new eye, the fresh eyes on the old on the Ninja side. Turtle yeah. series or something. You're like, oh, God. That was the plot. <laughs> actually, those it was his birthday. Do you want to know something I appreciated more as an adult? No one will agree with me, but the live-action Super Mario Brothers. Yes. Here's the reason. That movie, if you had a checklist of every element and theme and just let's have a noun from the Super Mario video games, yeah. they were present in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, double jumping, uh, mushrooms, bombs, uh, uh, fungi, mushroom. Everything was in that movie. Uh, I was very happy. They had ice. Uh, every kind of. Uh, they had the ice tubes and such. Like they yeah. had things that were winking back to like the levels. They had the deserts. They had. They had I don't Goombas. Know. They had Goombas. Uh, Koopas. Koopa was in there. The Princess scope. was in there. Yoshi was in there. They had the super scope as a weapon. Yes. <laughs> so all of these things existed, and, and and I remember that was that was the only time I've won when I went back to the Hollywood <laughs> thing. And I was like, good. Was, this is a little better. Is there a time <laughs> you've lost miserably, unfortunately? Or? Um. Actually, most recently, I tried to watch Billy Madison again. I couldn't yeah. get the oh. I couldn't get through 10 minutes. The voice of a generation. Yeah. I couldn't get through 10 minutes, and I remember <laughs> loving it when I was I quoted that, that movie, swan. like, every single day. Every day. I love it. Victoria Rules, man. <laughs> I, I, I got 10 minutes into it, and I went, ooh, no, I need to see a good Adam Sandler movie, and I put on Punch Drunk Love. And, and, then, wow. when, and then when I Wikipedia... It's not a big list, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, uh, actually, that one in Spanglish were two really noble attempts at him. Uh, that was... Watching his performance, at least right. watching him kind of open up. Has everyone seen Duncachino? Is that no, Duncachino? It's, uh, it's part of the Jack and Jill film. It's oh, uh, Al Pacino God. starring in a commercial for Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. it's a commercial oh. within the movie. Yeah, it's. Oh, yeah. I don't know what happened, man. <laughs> yeah. But I do. <laughs> we all go down. We all go down Wikipedia rabbit holes, and I went down one when I watched that uh, movie Punch Drunk, and uh, I saw that PT was watching classic Adam Sandler movies, and he said. Ah, I think it was Ebert who was reviewing Punch Drunk who went uh, casting Sandler in a movie like this in a role like that is almost a critique on his entire body of work where it's still very much Sandler playing a person who is good who can be very reserved and who has the potential to explode which is something we've always seen but this was an articulated really poetic uh, grounded version of him and it was almost like he, he assumed PT had watched him and went, no, this is how I want to see him. And <laughs> so it's the opposite of what you were talking about, where you see a serious movie and you go, like, I think, think of how that would be funny. P.T. Yeah. Anderson watched all the comedy movies and went, what if this was in a serious context? The right. same manic character, little nervous, little crazy sometimes, but in a serious context. Did they not also try to do that with like Jim Carrey yeah. and Robin Williams? Like they're like, let's do yeah. Now he first tried with the majestic with guys. and Simon Birch, little kid with problems, as David Spade calls it. Uh, uh, that was those. Those were really. God, early. that movie made me cry. That <laughs> scene with the bus. Yes, Whoa. man. Tr and Truman Show. Truman Show was. I really. Truman Show was Truman fantastic. Show. I think we. And then and, and to cap it off with Eternal Sunshine. I mean, Carrie has shown that like he's capable of it. But I'll be really interested to. See. I hate. Or Man on the Moon, which Man on the Moon, you know yes. everyone goes oh well comedy, but no, it was a really serious movie. Apparently, he scared people on that one because he was so like uncannily close to to the character. Well, he would show up as Tony Clifton at random like comedy clubs. In character, like just throughout the film. Uh, we were discussing about uh, immersing yourself in something to, to do your research before mm -hmm. doing it or not. Uh, Ray Fiennes uh, in the Cronenberg film Spider, if you haven't seen it, it's phenomenal. It's so good, and the performances alone. He's playing someone with, uh, uh, I guess, a mild form of autism. Um, and while there was research done in there, there were a lot of really good things that just organically came out. There was a certain beat in a scene where Ray Fiennes is in a bathtub, naked, fetal position, and he was just uh, doing something that uh, when, he, when he got out of the tub, a woman on set came up to him and inquired what his research was. And when he was done speaking, she said, well, um, you know, my, my son has uh, the same condition. Uh, he does that very thing uh, when, he's, when he's feeling the way you did in that scene. 
uh, and she just said that it really moved her and uh, you know that kind of validated some of the choices he made as an actor but I thought to myself if you if you kind of have fragments of, uh, of the puzzle like there's ten pieces to be found and you've got maybe even four of them maybe you have six so it doesn't matter if you got some of them we're, we're good at filling in the blanks I think we're good at interpolation seeing A and C and filling in B I mean that's all about him putting himself into that like, like mindset right mm-hmm. it's like things will follow yeah. is what I mean to say yeah. Well, yeah at the same time like you know you never want to spoon feed your audience completely. Mm-hmm. Like, people actually enjoy working for what they what they get out of books. So as long as you're like, you know, just giving them enough that they can make the jump there, mm-hmm. like help them get there. Help, sure. just yeah. help them get there, but don't hold their hand. It's all way. about balance, right? Because like, then you've got scenes where it's like a David Mamet script where two characters are talking, and for the good twenty minutes of it, you can't figure out what the hell's going on. You know, like, they're giving you bits and pieces, and it's gradually coming together. And by the end, you've got it, but it, sometimes it can take too long to get there, too. So it's it's about finding balance, I guess. Hmm. Man, you guys bring such expertise to this. <laughs> <laughs> We've just been, like, having silly shenanigans for the last two days. <laughs> You're like, so- name dropping? What is this? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I feel like I need to do more research just to, like, talk about what we're talking about writing, but you know. <laughs> um, well, it was good that you posted that video uh, with um, that gentleman, uh, I'm sorry, his name. Uh, Dan Harmon? Yes. yes. Oh, yes, no. uh, the, the one, actually, I have the John quote here. Hodge. Yeah, John Hodge. Yeah. Uh, well, there's, there's one piece from Dan, Dan Harmon, Harmon that I thought was interesting great. because, uh, of course, well, let's, let's lead into it. Uh, Dan Harmon, at 32, went to Glendale Community College and got coerced into joining a study group in a library for a biology class. Based on his experience, he created it's this like series. It's like show. He created community based on that experience. Oh my God! Wow. And and that's a case of un- I don't think he intentionally said I'm going to put myself into a school. It's just something that happened. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, same thing has happened to all of us. It's just that's the life experience of just being around me. Finally, you know, as I said before, writing about having roommates and then never actually having them until actually doing it, but not being like, I'm going to get roommates for research. Yeah. It was just it was a necessity. <laughs> as, as creators, we're generators, but first yeah. and foremost, as people, we're, we, we're processors. you got to just kind of live it. you got to take, you gotta take <laughs> try that to try and get someone to fill the spare room in my apartment and be like, need research person. <laughs> <laughs> Cost you like 550 a month. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you try to like form a roommate. You're like, I'm trying to write a comedy, damn it. So you need to be... You, know, you need the, to be wacky. Are you really the silly man to a straight messy? man. <laughs> How do you feel about painting a line down the middle of the apartment? <laughs> <laughs> it worked in the Brady box. <laughs> Four again. <laughs> so it did. Horizontally, of course. <laughs> I got top, you get bottom. Wait. <laughs> I'll, I'll bottom. You take the top. You have to build a lattice of stuff on the ceiling. <laughs> Swing like a monkey. <laughs> well, with things like Fight Club, uh, born from uh, experiences and such, actual ones, I'm, I'm trying to think. Oh, uh, if you yeah, think he actually Pond's started actually. a club. Pond, yeah, kind of thing. Well, what was... Uh, well, Paul, he, he, his nonfiction books, he kind of... He collects odd people. Yeah, he's a collector. It, like, you know, he wrote that book about in Portland, like going around and, and speaking to unusual people about their practices and what they do. And he loves to collect that, you know, people who go to support groups. I actually think he might have actually gone to some support groups yeah. just to hear what people have to say. Um, Which is informing yourself, yeah. You know, he, that's his thing, like... Uh, sometimes when I when I read or watch his stuff, I mostly read. Uh, I I do feel like I'm losing the voice of the character. I'm just getting oh, this is something collected. Yeah, and part of the collection. Personal. And yeah. you know that's his style of writing where he'll he'll break in with like random facts. It's like, did you know that this is the way this is designed? Or like, did you know how many cups of orange juice you need to make nitroglycerin? Like, it's like people are so <laughs> interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I need guy. to meet some of these people. <laughs> Fun fact. Actually works. Those weird cracks on a film out. set. We actually used frozen orange juice concentrate and gasoline uh, to make uh, napalm for a special effect. Wow, that's awesome. Does work. You can do don't, all sorts don't of stuff. Don't burn movies, yourselves. Teach don't. You people listening, do not try this. See, at this home. is why in TV shows they never show people using the drugs. It's always the after effect. Like in Lost, it'll be him and just like doing something with his teeth or whatever. It's like, oh, we just had drugs, but we didn't get to see him using it because I would teach everyone. How to <laughs> yeah. Well, they actually somebody was thinking like, well, when you watch Breaking Bad, are you actually seeing how to make meth? It's like, let me show you and it's actually uh, they got a lot of research done and they really f- practice all the different techniques they leave out some things or they won't show you certain things <laughs> now pour them and they cut to a wide shot and you don't hear them we don't, and show, them, the... we don't show them stirring <laughs> <laughs> we don't know if you don't it's stir it's, all, you don't it's not going to work stir, you deserve to blow up <laughs> Always stir your drugs. And even if they did, they might be like trying to stir the opposite direction. Like yeah. Go yeah. counterclockwise. Is it anti-clockwise? 
I guess uh, one of the last thoughts I had about uh, coming up with ideas is, do, I wonder if any of you guys do this. Like, have you ever, kind of like the, the movie experience, if you watch a movie, you're like, oh, it would have been funny if this happens. Do you ever see stuff happen in real life and you try to assume what's going on? Like all the time. In, in, yeah. in my case, it's like I, I, people watching, I got like, well, I got a package slip delivered to my house, yeah. and it wasn't my address. It was actually a house just down the street. So I go down, and it's it's an apartment complex. So I have no idea whose it is. But I'm like, uh, I'm trying to give this to so and so. She's like, Oh, I'm so and so. I'm like, I, I guess so. Okay, because that's her address. Right. Uh, I hand it to her. But then after I leave, I start thinking, being like, Is it hers, or is it like someone else's, and she's going to get like dirt on her from that? Or, <laughs> and then this story starts forming from this like. In, minor incident which I can just ignore entirely and it's like is, is this going to be a blackmail situation after this and does, does that stuff ever blow up in your heads whenever you're just like looking at things people walking by and high-fiving I can relate <laughs> most to watching something and thinking like oh this is how I'd rather it I think that's it, the big what if for me is is probably my my drive it, it, uh, not instances like that like all right, the project I'm working on is called uh, it's called the Ashley Protocol and it's about immortal children um in the year 2300. I put it in the year 2300 so I didn't have to rewrite history <laughs> and I could still have characters right. that are 200 years old. You never see them or anything like that. Um, so you have this kind of science fiction drama which it's very light side. Like I, I describe it as it could take place in the 50s, present day or the future. Like Kind of like how animated Batman series was like, what year is it? Um, that came from me watching a Daniel McIver play a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago at Stratford. Um, I was watching it and I was just bored to tears and I kept and I, and I was guessing everything that was going to happen. I was like, oh, this is going to happen next. Ah, oh, fuck. And, and the more it happened, I stopped being really like, yay me. I started feeling like, oh, shit, this. Uh, I, was, I was mad every time it was predictable and I thought, what would I really like to see? And I just sat there and ignored the play and just started brainstorming <laughs> ideas. And honestly, it's, 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 we all, I always wish it could be something like in the movie Flash of Genius where the dude was, he blinked and he went, oh, that's how the wipers will work. It's never that. Man, movie. I'm glad I didn't see that movie. Oh, it's so bad. It was, it's never that. Greg Kinnear invents the window wiper. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and here's the thing, it, take, it ruins his life. And it does. There's no catharsis. His life was wasted trying I, to get credit for I it. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in that pitch meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Studio executive sitting at his desk, you know, smoking a cigar. What do you got for me? It's a guy who invents the window wiper. I and have it completely wipers. destroys his life. <laughs> <laughs> and the ending is... It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think, have too much money. I think that, I think that when, we, when I don't have literal connections to the idea and the source, I feel like sometimes I feel like a fraud, and someone's going to be like, "Oh, that is not your idea." Uh, I always want to be able to prove where it came from. The, uh, the context is like, "Oh, I was doing this, and then oh, exactly." <laughs> well, always, you always think about like you know, while you're in the interview, and they're going to go, "So where did the genesis? What's the genesis yeah. for this idea?" You know, and you're doing your press, you're on ET Canada, you're on, <laughs> you know, whatever, and you're just like. Well, you know, I'll, I'll never forget my, uh, my, you know, like, you want to have that origin story, like yes. Silver Linings Playbook, David O. Russell, I didn't know this, at the SAG Awards last night, Jennifer Lawrence is accepting her award, and she goes, David, you're so great, you wrote this for your son, who's suffering from the same condition. I didn't know. Apparently, that's where he, he drew that from, but it's like, that's a, that's a good story for the press package, you know, like, I think about that. <laughs> you can't just say, well, I thought it would make money. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly those stories yeah. are out there yeah. um, you know Spirit in the Sky if you know that song it's in like every American football movie you know going up to the Spirit in the Sky uh, Christian rock song written by a Jewish guy who was like not religious at all and was just like hey Christian rock songs are making money I'm gonna do that <laughs> and he did and he made money and he's in every Disney football movie you know, remember the Titans and all that stuff. Well, they just don't bother interviewing him about it or nothing. Like, so how <laughs> well, but everybody knows up? now. Yeah. There's a, but it's like, you know, you, guys, you can't answer that. In a like, if somebody says, where did this script come from? You can't say, well, I thought that there was a lot of vampire stuff out, so I figured I'd, I'd <laughs> go yeah. for it. Mitchell and Webb, uh, uh, yeah. uh, oh, you, oh, excellent, excellent. If you ever get a chance uh, uh, to watch the Mitchell and Webb look, they have these two characters who are writers for, like, a medical show. They never do their research. <laughs> and they always cut to them. It's like the behind the scenes, and they're wearing, like, sweatpants, 5 o'clock shots of eating pudding in their kitchen which isn't clean and it's like you know well, what do you, what's your process for writing like the British ER and they're just like you know uh, we just kind of 
we don't want to bore the audiences and insult them by raising the intellectual bar. So it, just, <laughs> and it, just, it cuts to a scene and it's like, the doctors are coming. It's like, what's wrong with this patient? He's very poorly. Well, I'm going to get him the medicine. I gave him the wrong medicine. And, and, he and, needed blue. I gave him yeah. green. It's exactly ah. that. Yeah. And, 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 and I, just, I just wanted to mention it for the sake of humor because it's on the polar opposite side of, of yeah. do your research or you can do no research yeah. at all. And it's just very obvious. <laughs> Getting back to uh, stuff that you see, like, um, and then it kept becoming stories. One mm. of the things that always like bugs me is when I come across like weird articles of clothing sitting on park benches, <laughs> as if like someone was wearing it because it's still sitting up like this against the park bench. You're just like, well, what the hell Rapture. just happened here? <laughs> did, did this guy ascend? Did he get abducted by aliens? Did he turn to dust? Was is he, he a naked vampire? in the tree above you, snickering? <laughs> <laughs> is, is it, it, a, is it is? a trap? <laughs> like, what's going on? <laughs> like, are there people? going around doing this to mess with me like because you'll find articles of clothing especially when you live in a city like this all over the place yeah. mm -hmm. but you never really know the story about how they got there and there could be a million things of how that happened and well, that's that kind of the story of, of Amelie if you think about that you know she finds the box she wants to know the story where does it come from you know um, I don't know for me I, I I t I, maybe it's my own social anxiety, but I always tend to think people are up to nefarious purposes. Mm. Yeah. I'll see someone on the streetcar and he's like, he's doing this, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> he's something's going well. <laughs> he's, he's, he's up to something. His hands together. He's up to something. Yes. Yeah. For the people listening, I was rubbing my hands together in an yeah. evil way. Is he uh, cold or is he plotting? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like where did he? J I'm always thinking, where did he just come from? Yeah. You know, what what is on his mind? What's going through his head over the experience that he just had? Did he just get dumped? Did he just? You know, fall in love? Did he just have a fantastic date? Is he coming from the morning <laughs> after? Like, is he? What What happened to this man? And then, like, the journey begins from mm -hmm. there. Kind of like, yeah. Kind of another version of that is if you can't help but overhear phone calls on streetcar, subway. Oh yeah. Do you try to fill in what the questions are Always. to be like, why was this answer that? <laughs> you just like, li play like, the other end. I like hearing people ramble on, especially when I don't know them, just because I like hearing different talking patterns. It really helps me when I'm running characters. I don't force isms on characters who like say now see at the end like like <laughs> gangsters like i don't i don't try and force anything like that but yeah. sometimes uh, people do have a particular voice that i just you just want to kind of steal yeah well that's one of the things that always amazes me like a writing what you know to one degree but also being able to create enough individual characters that they're all fully foreign but you're not in your life any one of those particularly you don't use those isms you don't act that way you're, you're either just looking for opposites of you or grabbing from those people you hear and just creating someone else mm -hmm. um, you know it's, it's a notion of intertextuality just like you're always drawing upon everything you've experienced in your life but also everything you've consumed everything you've read everything you've watched it all factors in right and no experience whether it's yours or someone else's that you've seen is, is any less valid because at the same time everybody who reads your work if it's a book or watches your work if it's a script or a play or a film um, they're also going to color with their experiences so they're going to watch your character and the way you informed it and all the experiences that you put into it. But when they watch it, they're going to go, oh, yeah, that reminds me of that time that I went to a coffee shop, you know? And they're going to relate it to all of their experiences. I feel almost, after hearing what you said, it almost feels like, outside of technical mumbo-jumbo, it's almost hard not to write what you know. Absolutely. <laughs> you can never write as anyone else, and that's why like everyone is like, oh, I'm going to write a Hangover-style movie, or I'm going to write a you know Twilight-style movie. You can't write in someone else's voice, not successfully. Yeah. When I was six you can always tempt, yeah. but that's when the things don't tend, tend to work out too well for you. Yeah. When I was 16 years old, uh, um, I wanted to like make a something within my capacity, like a really gritty indie movie with like a home video. And I'm like, what story would that tell? And I came up with, uh, I think it was like Cold Turkey. And uh, the story in its premise form was um, in dealing with his older brother's overdose death, a young uh, high school student, to see if he can forgive his brother, and that's his personal mission, um, is, is getting in, intentionally making his own documentary to get hardcore addicted to drugs, and he's gonna try and wean himself off with just sheer willpower. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's fantastic. And I, I got to page maybe 20. Maybe, and that took, that took a long time, and that just died. I never touched it again. And I don't even know if I ever will, just because it's one of those <laughs> things where I feel like I have to be informed to some degree. Uh, no, no not, not to do drugs, uh, but like, I feel like I would have to do my research on that. That's yeah. not something I can just suppose or add a magic what if to. Sure, because then you end up writing a character who's like, 
man, this heroin is no good for me. I'm going to stop right now. <laughs> and then they stop. And it's and like, stop. you know, and it's Cold like, turkey. well, no, you can't. It doesn't work that <laughs> way. It's a chemical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that also depends on the perspective because maybe, you know, like uh, a religious fanatic would believe that, you know, if you prayed hard enough, you would just be done the next day. A lot of people so, could finish never that script. Once, That's the thing. Thing. <laughs> a lot of people could finish that script mm -hmm. uh, with their own biased opinions. But at the end of the day, I don't feel like that story could ever... What makes it interesting is if it were real. It would only yeah. be interesting if someone did make that documentary. But, Otherwise, it's all someone's opinion because someone has to do it. And if someone's going to have to do it, why not film it? So that's uh, the ultimate Catch-22 kind of uh, plot for a movie. <laughs> it can only be done right if it's done honestly, but yeah. you have to find the guy crazy enough to do it. But at the same time, like, it's really hard to do anything honestly because yeah, at some point someone will be doing the edits. Yes, I haven't been subjected to that yet just because my writing hasn't brushed uh, professional world enough. I'm only as far as like acting and film editing. So how, what's your experiences with uh, uh, maintaining what part of yourself or anything you put into your scripts until it touches someone else's hands? Um, I really don't have too many because so far <laughs> I guess... I've had full creative control over everything I have. Like running the, the anthology project is really easy for me because it's like, I'm going to write whatever and then show it to my artist and they can make, and they, then we'll discuss the edits and I don't have to give um, it to anyone higher. <laughs> I mean, I can speak to this and uh, I had a really personal sort of experience with that. I directed a film that I co-wrote with uh, Graham uh, who normally... Who told me who about was this? Who was, <laughs> was here last time, but he's not here this time, and uh, he probably will listen to this. Um, so I'll try and speak Hi, as honestly Graham. as I can. Um, where basically we sort of went back and forth with the script, but I ultimately directed it. And before shooting, I took another pass at the script on my own, uh, thinking like, okay, what do I need for the shots? You know, how can I adjust the structure to make the pacing make more sense for filming? And then halfway, so he came out to set, uh, and this was my bad, I didn't share the script with the changes with him. And so halfway through shooting, all the cast, all the crew were saying, man, we read your script, we really love it, we're like... So you're really, fueled by now. You're really ha we're really happy that you're here, uh, you know, coming out on set and watching this film come together. And mm -hmm. then in the middle of the shoot, he read the script and the changes. And... Was he pissed? It, it caused a big rift in our like friendship and our in our partnership creatively. Mm -hmm. It was really difficult. Um, and during the time, I mean, I was on set. Thousands of dollars were being spent every day, and I couldn't deal with it at the time. You know, I basically had to say like, ah, "This sucks," and I'd love to stop everything and like fix this. But I have all these people waiting for me, and very limited time and very limited budget to work with. So I just had to keep going. He, he left the set and I finished the film. And then two weeks after shooting, we got together and, and talked. And I'm happy to say that we've hashed things out and you know we still communicate creatively. But um, it can be very difficult for a writer uh, to feel like their work has been transformed uh, or bastardized or, I don't know, weakened in any way. Alan Moore. <laughs> sure, but you know, at the same time, you as a writer, you also have to learn to live with the fact that there will always be some changes. I mean, it's you should be apprised of them before you come to a set, ideally, yeah. so you know what you're walking into. That you're not like, how did my movie suddenly become a porn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which does happen. Suddenly, it's like, oh well, the producers wanted a bunch of sex scenes added yeah, to Dawn with you know, titillation. Completely different originally. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, um, you have to deal with that moment where you go. Where's that huge monologue that I wrote? Or where's that amazing scene that had no dialogue where they just look at each other and all this stuff is expressed? Where did it go? But, you know, things work, things don't work. You write a character with a voice that's, you know, they go, nah, see, at the end of every sentence yeah. or whatever it is. <laughs> and then the actor tries it and it falls flat and you cut it out. Like, you know, on the day, there's a person there with a binder with your script who's going, oh, the actor said it differently. We're going to use that instead. Or just just scraping lines right off the page things yeah. you've labored over for hours it's just you know oh we, well he can't he can't seem to say this he said something similar good enough <laughs> like yeah it. and then that's the reality of it you know yeah. that's it's hard it really is and then even after that in the editing booth it changes again yeah <laughs> yeah that's, that's it too that's, that's where the movie and then really in the edit you cut out half the scenes that you shot you know uh, <laughs> it's kind of like oh they had a good conversation there but uh, we can't really spare the two minutes so otherwise oh. we have to cut down the <laughs> horrible chase scene with the whippy cam we gotta have that so you know like uh, and it, it comes into the notion of like 
pacing your story and where do you start and where do you end and what's the most dramatic point, you know? Like Sherlock Holmes, the first Sherlock Holmes movie, one of the things that always interested me was uh, when you start that movie, he's already in the middle of it. He's already chasing the girl who was kidnapped by Lord Blackwood or whatever oh, it is. Dude, it was like Lethal Weapon 2. It's like, yeah. who are we chasing? <laughs> it's right in the middle. And like, you know, why didn't they start it in the scene where the mother comes in and says, help, my daughter's been kidnapped. You have to help me, Sherlock. You know, why didn't they start it when the girl, with the girl and the guy comes and kidnaps her? Like, there's so many choices they could have made and they, maybe they shot those scenes and they just never made it out. That's a good side. That's quite possible, yeah. It was like the, uh, the Starbucks lady from the Avengers, the one who... Yeah. There, there's this coffee shop lady who... No, 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 she, she was, was in, like, What Women Want. Like, she's an actress. Yeah. And but, like, well, I don't mean, like, yeah, she's yeah. not but an actress, but her character is, like, a Starbucks, you know, yeah. she, employee. Yeah, she works at a coffee place. And I'm watching the Avengers, and I know at the very end, like, she's, like, she keeps showing up her face once in a while, yeah. and then at the end she's like, oh, thank you, Captain America on TV. I'm like... I feel like there's something more, more that was going it. on here because she's just too important, you know. Unless she's like someone's cousin or girlfriend, they just put in the film. Then, but there was scenes. Yeah, there was deleted all scenes where she had this whole thing with Captain America, like as um, uh, not Captain America, the obviously, but just like his regular, you know, outside. Yeah, persona. just and it was, it was just this nice little moment <laughs> they shared, and then like later on, it's like holy shit, that's the guy who I serve coffee and he just saved our life with a giant shield. Like, whoa, my brain's exploding. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that that moment meant nothing to me when, when it happened because of the deleted scene? I'm just like, oh, she's ogling at the superhero. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's it. Yeah. It's just, like, I, I thought they were trying to like bring a, a humanity moment because like, within all this disaster, there's the barista. <laughs> and it's like, I feel the pain of the individual kind of thing. I thought that's what sure. they were trying I to do. I think that's what they were trying to do. But they just In the edit. Yeah, but not, but, they didn't, but like, you know, let's, so like, what about adaptation too? Like, if you go, like, not the movie adaptation, but adapting <laughs> books to films. Um, yeah. Like, you know, we talked about Fight Club earlier. Um, <laughs> yeah. the ending of Fight Club is totally different from the ending in the film uh, like the novel versus the film and Chuck Palahniuk on the commentary track on the DVD he goes actually I like this ending better that they did in the film oh wow you know so there's a situation where it's like they said well we're gonna change your ending you know it's precious yeah. this is a best selling book and we're gonna totally tweak tweak what you did yeah. and it's true like it ended up being for the best things turn out better you know you and might see someone you get Hunger Games Yes, yeah, someone adapts your work, and you say, "Well, you know what? I wouldn't have thought that way, but actually, it's stronger." It's also a different medium, so you have to accept your book still exists. Yeah, like they didn't erase your book because this, this movie. I, showed I had up. this conversation with someone about *Mammoth's Gun Gary* when it was adapted to the screen, and he wrote that extra monologue for Alec Baldwin. And I thought to myself, the story *Glen Gary Glenn Ross* has evolved. I don't mm. feel like there's an old one, a new one, a film one, and a stage one. I feel like would someone get away? with taking that monologue and putting it in the stage production would someone go eh in the audience so like, <laughs> but see that's now you're talking about something that's it is produced in another form because it went on stage as a play with yeah. a screenplay for a film I mean yeah the screenplay exists as a stack of paper but people don't really see it in the same way like people don't go out to the bookstore and buy screenplays I mean film people do but that's it <laughs> Yeah, no one goes, I'm going to sit down and read the screenplay this weekend. You know, no one's watching the movie and going, I bet the screenplay was really good, though. (laughs) I think I was seeing Life of Pi, and I was like, man, I was kicked off the rewrites for this script a lot of times. I had the tiger eat him on the basis basis that everybody loves pie. (laughs) (laughs) I feel bad if we end on that note. (laughs) (laughs) But I feel... I feel really got to rein in. Uh, definitely, in the end, I, I feel the idea of writing what you know is not as much of a limiter as it might sound, but an encourager to pursue. And, and, and you know, you don't have to go so analytical, as we said. It's mm-hmm. it's an encourager to just be aware, uh, to live, but also to make sure you're true to yourself. Like, I'm just trying to pick everything someone said <laughs> and put it in here. The answer is there's no easy answer, I think. <laughs> I hate to say it. I hate it's, to say that we've come to no it's just good to simple think about it. sound It's good to think about. Yeah. It's, it's, good. It's, <laughs> we can't it's all about this. balance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we need to know that every human being has their own way of experiencing emotions. I think in the in the movie Waking Life, there's a fantastic uh, monologue. Well, the whole movie's all monologues. But <laughs> there's one in particular, which is like language is inert, and we all express language differently. So when I say uh, love, you go through your memories of love or lack of love, times that you've lost your loves. But how do I know that my love is the same as your love? Maybe what I experience as love feels like a headache, and for you it feels like butterflies in the stomach, or you know, for you it feels like, I don't know, gassy. I don't whatever. It is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying though? Like we all we all relate through language and through our writing, but you know, we can only express it as much as we know. 
and the way they interpret it is going to be totally different no matter what we do. Wow. You did a way better job than I did. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> I was also thinking of your Waking love, love is my love. That song is your love. That's a song. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, can we like splice that in at the end? Yeah. Do you guys know the words? <laughs> you no. Your credits. love is my love. I do your your love. <laughs> Damn it. Well, thanks for talking to me. I think that your song, <laughs> I think you singing it just there is the yeah, that's, that's all that's, I need. I'll leave it at that then. <laughs> and see. Find out more about Right Night by joining the Facebook group. It's on Facebook. <laughs>